Welcome to Scoot Talk Sports, episode 10. I've been lucky enough to uh, snag some time with uh, Daryl Fordyce, the captain of the Valor FC team within the Canadian Premier League. So thank you very much for taking the time to join us today, Daryl. Thanks, Jeremy. Good to be on and chat yeah, with really, you. Yeah, really appreciate it. As you can see, I'm a little bit uh, biased when I choose some of my uh, my interviewees, but uh, I really do appreciate you being here today uh, <laughs> and taking some time away from family. I know that, uh, you know, it, family time is very, very important, especially after being on the road for so long uh, for preseason. So I really do appreciate it. So what I'm thinking today, we'll just do a little bit of a walkthrough, maybe through your career. You could share a little bit about uh, yourself, about some of the experiences you've had through your career. And uh, I definitely want to pick your brain about your experience here in Winnipeg as well. And uh, yeah, um, really appreciate you taking the time. So growing up in Northern Ireland, what was it like growing up in Northern Ireland? And can you remember what your first memory of football was like growing up in Northern Ireland? Do you, did you have a team? Did you have a club? Was it passed down through the family? What was your first memory? Yeah, um, I grew up supporting Limfield. They were a team in Belfast that I eventually played for. Um, my dad supported them as well. So they were the closest team to where I lived. And I used to go up. My dad first took me up to the games. Um, I think actually the first ever game I went to was a Manchester United Aston Villa friendly, which was at Windsor Park, which is Limfield in Northern Ireland's uh, stadium. So that was the first game I ever went to. You know, I remember uh, seeing Ryan Giggs, and that was a, the first time uh, like I seen Ryan Giggs play as a young kid, and I, he was my favourite player ever since I was a kid. But yeah, growing up in Northern Ireland, my dad took me up to the games um, at a very young age. You're talking, like I must have been five or six and then I guess seven or eight was whenever I was sort of allowed to go out with my friends without my parents because growing up in Belfast um, the area that I I grew up in it was quite a a rough tough area at the time and there was troubles then but it was very safe for the people who lived there because everybody knew everybody so People would leave their doors open. Um, everyone was very comfortable with each other. Um, and the stadium was only a 10-minute a walk from my house. So I was able to walk to the games on a Saturday with my friends. Um, and obviously, whenever you're seven or eight, you don't have any money to pay for tickets. <laughs> so we would go up and ask. There, there was uh, the turnstiles, and there was a gap at the bottom. And we would ask the, the guy you know, who was taking the tickets or the money, um can we crawl under for free <laughs> so yeah if you got a nice one they would let you crawl under and then eventually um a guy at the door a guy called beller who still works there um i played i went to school with a son the son was a year older than me and then whenever he he seen us he would just let us through the door without having to crawl under because the bigger we got we couldn't fit under anymore um <laughs> So then he would let us go in whenever no one was there. His boss wasn't looking, he would let us go in. Um, and grew up, I, I would go to all the Linfield games every Saturday. So yeah, that, that was my first memories as football. Tradition. So Ryan Giggs was, your, was your, your, your kind of hero growing up? Was that your... Yeah, he was the first one. You know, I grew up, my, my dad grew up as a Manchester United fan. Um, and that's where we watched it on the TV. And just seeing Ryan Giggs, you know, he would go dribble past people as, as if they weren't there. He was so quick. And that that was a big hype. There was Ryan Giggs, Eric Cantona. But uh, Ryan Giggs is the one that I, as a kid, that he stood out to me. Um, and, and that's the one, him. And then obviously when Paul Scholes came in a few years later. Um, and obviously, you, like, I was very lucky. I was very, very lucky growing <laughs> up as a Manchester United fan. Yeah. At that age, uh, at that stage, when you had Giggs, Beckham, Scholes, the Neville brothers, you know, that was the class of 92. And Alex Ferguson is the manager. That, Whenever I look back on it now, I'm like, I was very, very fortunate to, to grow up watching that team and that manager for for many years. So I was very, very fortunate that way. Yeah, it's interesting. As more time passes, it becomes more and more you realize how important and how rare that consistent performance from, from Man United was, right? So, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, 
you're you're young you're you're five six you're really starting to see games you know you're, you're sneaking under the turnstile when you're when you're allowed to um uh, when would you st- when did you start playing like consistently was it right away as, as long as you can remember or was it something that grew with with uh you know seeing the game live yeah no i was always playing with a ball in the streets you know back then we didn't have anything online you know the internet wasn't even invented then um i guess you would have had an atari if you remember an atari <laughs> yeah. or a commodore 64 i think it was called you know my sisters had those um and then obviously the the first uh, Nintendo came out. But again, it was, I wanted to be outside with a ball and I was always playing football with my friends or soccer as we call it now. Yeah. Um, and then whenever I was seven years of age, I was playing for the Boys Brigade, which would be sort of the Scouts, I think, similar to the Scouts here. Um, you had the Girls Brigade and the Boys Brigade and it was always, it was always in a church. But you, you got to play. You got to play soccer. Um, they give you snacks and things like that. So it was. It was sort of like a youth club more. Um, yeah. And we always played a game um, every Saturday. And then that's whenever one of the games I played. I remember a guy coming and speaking to me after. And then my leader, as we called him, um, he spoke to my leader, and my leader was able to pass on my father's phone number. Uh, because back then you had six numbers and that was it. I remember my number yep. 230872 and you, <laughs> that was drilled into you wherever you went. Yep. You had to remember those six numbers because you could pick up a pay phone and then you could ho- get hold of your parents with the landlines. So th- the guy phoned my dad and it was in, it was actually a guy called Joe Kincaid who was a, he ran a club called St. Andrews in Belfast and he was also the Glasgow Rangers scout for Northern Ireland. So he obviously seen me play at seven years of age, brought me up to St. Andrews um, for the under nines team. And that's whenever I started to play regularly, train regularly. Um, and that's when I really got into it. So I was seven playing for an under nines team and, and played for that, played for St. Andrews up until I was 16. Um, and then whenever I was 10, Rangers would bring me over, fly me over every two weeks until I was 16. So, like, right from seven years of age, I was into it, training properly. Um, and then at 10, I was I was thrown into one of the, the top professional teams in the world, in Glasgow Rangers. So I had very, very good um, coaching and training at a very, very young age. Do you remember any coaches or people when you were when you were training with the with the Rangers that really made an impact? Was there anybody that you, that sticks out? Um, it was more so Joe Kincaid himself. You know, yeah. he was um, he, he ran St Andrews, at the club that I was I was with, and he produced I think eighty six professionals came out of it, came out of the wow. club. The Euro the Euro twenty sixteen when Northern Ireland actually played, half the starting lineup came through my boys club. So you have players like Stephen Davis, Chris Brunt, you know, players that played Premier League football. Um, Keith Gillespie, he wasn't in Euro, Euro 2016, but, you know, he came through at Man United and played for Newcastle for years, Champions League. But yeah, it was more so Joe Kincaid himself. Um, and then I guess at that time I was there, Rangers, the, Dick Advocat was the manager. It was Walter Smith and then Dick Advocat became the manager. And he was Dutch, so there was a lot of Dutch coaches there. And I remember one called Jan Dirk, um, when we actually went to Holland for a tournament. And he was excellent. You know, he would, he would really be on your case and drilling things into you, but in a good way. Yeah. And I remember we were playing Club Rouge from Belgium, and he was, he was like giving us instructions the whole half. And at half time, he says, he just gave me a little tip. Look, if you do this and do that, and then straight out half time, and I done it and scored. And then after the game, he was like, "That that that's why you listen to your coaches, you know." And and it was actually that tournament we got to the final, and we played Barcelona in the final, and they beat us. They beat us two nil, uh, and we beat Arsenal. We beat Feyenoord. We beat Club Bruges on the way to the final. And after the game, I remember being on the phone to my dad and. He says, how did you play in the final? And I just says, I, I don't think I touched the ball. We, like, 
after the game, all our players were like, hey, we, we hardly touched the ball. And then it wasn't until 2018, I went back to Belfast um, for one of my coaching badges. And one of my teammates from Rangers was actually on the same course as me. And he says to me, do you remember the tournament we played? We got to the final against Barcelona. And he pulled up these photographs he had on his phone. And Messi played against us. <laughs> so we had Messi, Pique, um, Fabregas. Those three played. Um, and I was like, no wonder we couldn't get the ball off those guys. <laughs> so I would, I, wait, I, I would love to get hold of the video of the game um, just to see it. And yeah. I guess Barcelona have it somewhere in their in their locker. But yeah, that that was that was an incredible time. Well, that would be cool to see that video, wouldn't it? I mean, you know, on on one hand, to see the players you're playing against, but also to see the ten percent of uh, possession you guys had. It sounds like. Yeah, I I, I think <laughs> I might have got three touches, and it might have been three fouls, so I didn't even get the ball. <laughs> uh, so here's a here's a question for you. So you know, you're growing up. At, in St. Andrews Academy, you're getting these touches with, with the, the Rangers. You're, you're, how did the, the deal with Portsmouth come around? Because it, it seems like you spent some time um, in their academy system as well, including a loan out to Burnmouth. How did, how did that Portsmouth deal come around? So it was actually, I was playing for St. Andrews and uh, Joe, had, Joe Kincaid, our, our boss of the club, he had a fallout with one of the leagues. So the best league was called the Lisbon Youth League. And there, I ended up, he had a fallout with the league and then he took our team out of that league into the South Belfast League, which was the second best. But there was only one other good team in that league and I was 15 at the time. So it was really, I need to be playing against really good competition to keep pushing my game. Mm -hmm. And the first game we played, I think we won something like 16 nil. Um, <laughs> And after the game, uh, my dad says, OK, we're going to have to move your club. You know, when I, came, I was at St Andrews since I was seven until I was 15. And he realized that I needed to be playing competitively because once you turn 16, that's when you that's that was whenever you you had to try and get a team across the water. And obviously, I was signed with uh, Glasgow Rangers at the time. Um, I actually had an option in the contract that once I turned 16, it was my choice whether to go over to Rangers with, for a two-year contract. Um, but Rangers were full of, not full, but the whole club had so many Dutch players and they were signing all these, all these top quality players from Holland, um, you know, from Barcelona, even my, at the time they signed Mikel Arteta on loan when he was 19. Oh, wow. You know, so this is the quality like they were competing with Bayern Munich in the Champions League and, and they were signing all these young players that were, you know, whenever you talk soccer, there's levels. And whenever you see these kids playing, it, it was just another level you, that you couldn't compete with. Um, and you need you really need to get in to get game time to keep improving. So uh, after the game, my dad just says, look, I seen you walking around the pitch. Um, you sort of lost interest. Um, and I'm going to make a hard decision that, hey, we got to get back into the Lisbon Youth League and play competitively. So I ended up signing for Lisbon Youth. One of my friends, my, my best man at my wedding, played for that team. And he put a word in for me. I went up and played for Lisbon Youth. And in the first game I played, uh, like the Lisbon Youth League had a lot more scouts. You know, um, and everyone knew, everyone in Northern Ireland knew that I'd signed for Rangers. I was, I was with St Andrews, you know, no one really touched our players, so to speak, because um, it was sort of an agreement. Um, it was like, hey, just stay away from those guys. And then obviously you had uh, a couple of other teams. But I had Arsenal. I had Liam Brady on the phone with my dad. Arsenal wanted me over. Manchester United wanted me over. Newcastle. I could name every, every team in the Premier League in the Championship because so cool. back then it was every team had a scout and they try to source the best players in the country. You know, but at the time you had players like Johnny Evans coming through, Darren Gibson that played for Man U and Everton, you know, a lot of, lot of quality players around my age. Um, but yeah, I ended up going to Lisburn Youth, and then after the first game, the Portsmouth scout, a guy called Robbie Walker, spoke with my dad, asked what was going on, and Ranger, Glasgow Rangers were going through a transition moment. 
with the, the Dutch cat, like a lot of the Dutch kids coming in. Um, Dick Avocat lost his job. So then there was a new manager coming in and we weren't sure what was going on at the club at, at Rangers. Uh, and I hadn't been over in two months. So I was flying over every two weeks and then I hadn't been over in two months because of the transition of the club. Didn't know what was going on. So the Portsmouth scout asked, asked me if I wanted to go over. And it just happened to be at the right moment uh, that he asked. And I was like, sure, let's go over. And Portsmouth were in the championship at the time. They weren't in the Premier League. Um, and whenever I look back on it now, it's like, why didn't I go over to Manchester United or Arsenal or one of the top clubs? But it was just one of those. It was just at that moment, at that time, I could go over um, the following week. I'm like, sure. Um, and it just happened to be at that moment. So the day that I was actually going over to Portsmouth, the, the ranger scout turns up and he's like, hey, you're going over to Glasgow tomorrow. And I, I'm like, I, I've already arranged to go over to Portsmouth. You know, so he didn't take that too well. But I went over to Portsmouth. Um, they asked me to go over the second time. Uh, it was sort of like a trial basis that the English coaches have to assess you. Mm -hmm. And I went back over the second time. And Portsmouth timed it really well because they brought me over uh, in the game that they got promoted. So whenever I was there and they got promoted, you know, the city was absolutely bouncing. out. They were so happy. There were thousands of people in the streets. You know, they hadn't been in the Premier League. And all of a sudden, I'm like, whoa, this place is, this is excellent. So obviously the guys from England knew what they were doing. <laughs> um, and then after the game, they called me in, you know, and I got to meet Paul Merson, um, you know, one of the Premier League's greatest players. And that, that's when they offered me a contract. And I was like, hey, I'm only 16. And, <laughs> uh, and I says, look, I need to speak with my dad. So that's how I ended up with Portsmouth um, rather than going over to Rangers. And I, I supported Rangers. I was with them since I was 10. Um, and I had other clubs, but I just had a good feel. I liked the coaches there. There was a good setup. Um, and it was, I guess it was at the right time. But again, I was very... Very thankful to have that opportunity, you know, because it could have been different where Rangers might have pulled out of their deal somehow and then I would have had to stay in Northern Ireland and the clubs are, the clubs, Linfield are full-time now, full-time professional club, whereas back then they weren't. Um, so you would have trained twice a week. Um, you would, I would have had to get a job or get, go to college, whereas I was very fortunate to get into a Premier League academy and experience that for four years. What was your biggest takeaway from that four years in that academy? Was it the was it the loan out to, to Burnmouth for a bit of game time there, or was it the, the grind of a you know professional, just promoted Premier League club? It was whenever I came away. It was just knowing or, or realizing the level of training that you have to put in to stay or to get better mm -hmm. um, and and you really can't take any days off you know and and that was one of the things that whenever I left after four years you know I went on loan to Bournemouth and they were in League One and I was only 19 I think you know and, and I wasn't a big guy and I just remember like obviously I, I was training I was in the first team squad at Portsmouth and we had some big players in the squad but they were they were so good on the ball. A lot of the players, um, even though they weren't big, they were so good on the ball, you couldn't get the ball off them. But it wasn't until I went to Bournemouth and I realised that, hey, these guys are monsters. And the game was played differently. You know, it's only two leagues below the Premier League, but the standard in the Premier League compared to League One was, you know, it was night and day. Um, you know, so it was more of a physical game, whereas whenever I was with Portsmouth, it was more of a thinking game. Um, and I'm, I've always been a thinker, uh, haven't been a big guy, you know, obviously I've, I've grown a little bit more now and, but that was a, the biggest thing coming away and understanding that the level, you, you need to be really, really fit. Um, and if you're not fit, if you're off it slightly, then you, you'll be found out. And you see it with the Premier League when some players are coming back from injury or I'll take Harry Kane, for example. You know, you can see when he's not firing, 
he's just not that he's just off the mark a little bit. He's not as sharp. And then when he does start scoring goals, you can see how sharp he is. Yeah. So that that's one thing, for example. But those guys are huge. Uh, I remember like being in the in the hallway and guys like Steven Gerrard or Lampard, Drogba, you know, even Michael Carrick, guys you see on T V and they don't look big. Like when they walk past it, these guys are they're full on big, big boys. Um, and then you'll see smaller players, but then you go on the pitch and no one can get near them because they're so sharp. Yeah. But that was the big the biggest thing for me, understanding that the level that you have to or the the work that you have to put in to stay fit and and, and get fit, um, because if you're off the mark slightly, then then you'll be found out. So this brings me this brings me to uh, what I think is kind of a cool little little stat here is the next club you went to play for I think is Glen Torren if I, hopefully I'm saying that right and you scored yeah. five goals in your first game with them is that is that true? No, it wasn't the first game I played. Um, <laughs> So I grew. Whenever I grew up, I supported Linfield, and Linfield and Glen Torn, they are big, big rivals. They're like Rangers, Celtic. They're like yeah. Arsenal, Tottenham. You know, just big, big rivals. All the derbies in the world, they're up there with the the hate that they have for each other. Yeah. So I grew up supporting Linfield, and uh, I got released from Portsmouth. Um, I went up to Stoke City for a while. And Tony Pulis was the manager. They were in the championship. And he basically said to me, if I if we get promoted, I'm not going to sign you because I'm going to have 80 million pounds, 80 million pounds to sign players. Yeah. You know, if we stay in the championship, I want to sign you. And while I was there, they got promoted. So then I didn't get a contract with Stoke. I then went to Luton Town, who were in League One, and Cle Kevin Blackwell was the manager. And I went to Cyprus with him for pre-season. On the way home in the plane, he offered me a two-year contract. Come in tomorrow, we'll sign it. So I came in the next day, and the next day, the club went in the administration. Oh my goodness! So I'm like, like the luck is just not. Uh, I'm just not getting any luck, any yeah. luck here. And the season was. I think the season was starting in maybe three weeks' time. So I had to. I flew back to Belfast because. My agent was trying to get me a club, but a lot of the, the rosters were, were getting signed up with, with players and there wasn't much room left. So I went back to Belfast. I had to pay my own flight. Actually, it's the first time a club never paid for my flight. Um, <laughs> and I ended up in Belfast. And uh, my under-21s assistant manager for Northern Ireland was a, a guy called Alan McDonald. And he just took over the, the Glen Torn job. And Alan's a legend in Northern Ireland. He passed away, I think, maybe 10 years ago. Um, but he became the manager of Glen Torn and, and phoned me and says, hey, let's sign for Glen Torn. And I says, look, I can't. You know, I, I come from, I grew up, I grew up in Sandy Row. Um, you know, if I move back to Belfast, this is where I'm going to live. And it's a big Linfield place. All my friends support at Linfield. And uh, it just didn't feel right, you know, as a young kid growing up supporting Linfield. Yeah. And he says, look, come up and, and train. So I actually went up and trained with him. And like, honestly, the, it, I don't really want to say it in, in this way, but whenever I seen the badge, the Glenthorne badge, I didn't, I didn't like the look of the badge because it was built into me as a young kid. Yeah. This is my enemy. <laughs> um, but yeah, I spoke with Linfield and, and Linfield had a, they had their squad set. They were the best in the country for sure. And, Alan McDonald explained and says, look, we're trying to push for the league. We're trying to win trophies. And I spoke with a, a player. There was a couple of other teams up after me. And I spoke with a player and he says, look, if you want to sign for money, sign for one of the other teams that are offering you, you know, signing on fees, uh, cash under the, under the table, things like that. Mm -hmm. Or if you want to try and win trophies, then sign for Glen Torn or Linfield. If Linfield's out of the question, you know, if you want to win trophies, you got to sign for Glen Torn. So obviously I show, I'm like, look, I've played the game to win trophies. I've never played it for the money. And that's when I signed for Glen Torn. Um, and then uh, back then it was obviously the newspapers. You read the back of the newspaper. There was no Twitter or anything. Yeah. And the back of the Belfast newspaper was like, Lymphie man signs for Glen Torn. 
So I, I was I was right on the back foot, straight into the Glen Torn, and um, the fans weren't too happy that it was a a Lymphy man is called a blue man, yeah. that a blue man had signed for their club. Um, but I, as it says, you know, no matter who I play for, I'll always give a hundred percent. Um, and I had to win the fans over, you know, and, and, and I knew by that was to put in performances. But it was actually the the game I scored five in, that was the fourth year I was with Glen Torn. Okay. Um, our strikers were injured and I says to the coach, you can throw me up front. Um, and I was actually on the transfer list because we, we got a new, Alan McDonald lost a job. We got a new coach in who was big pro, pro Glen Torn. And... I guess I was one of the top earners at the time and he, he was trying to cut down the weight budget and plus he knew I was a Linfield supporter mm. and he was trying to get a, a trade with me and Linfield, um, which we couldn't get done um, for different reasons and uh, our strikers get injured, you know, and he didn't want to play me, but he didn't have any option. He threw me up front and I scored five and I got home <laughs> that night and I was taken off the transfer list. <laughs> but uh, suddenly you're more valuable, hey? <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. It was like I came in afterwards, and um, you know the boys were giving a round of applause, and the transfer window was actually still open for another two weeks. Um, and I, I, I says to the manager, you know, after that performance, I'm sure a few clubs will will up their offers a little bit more. Um, and then that that night he called me and says you're taken off the transfer list. Um, so I, I played for another year at Glen Torn, and then at the following that year, I signed for Limfield, and I was the first player in a very long time to move move from Glen Torn to Limfield, or even Limfield to Glen Torn. It hadn't been done in a long time, so that was a big that was big in the public eye, um, and I, and I wasn't the uh, one side of the city. I was very popular, and the other side I wasn't, and and Belfast is a very close city. Yeah, you know, so I had to be very careful in certain areas that I couldn't go to, um, and that's the way Belfast was anyway. Growing up, yeah. you're either Protestant or Catholic. There were some areas that you couldn't go to, um, and and you knew which areas to stay away from. But uh, yeah, that was interesting times. I was going to say there can't have been that many players who've gone back and forth between those two clubs in, in their history, right? So it, it's yeah. pretty. It's there, pretty there, interesting. there actually has been since whenever I I done it. I think there might have been maybe five or six, seven, eight within three or four years. Um, I think, and now it's actually players go back and forward now. There's no problem because uh, the country's trying to um, have peace and stay stay peaceful. They don't want the troubles again. So yeah. it's like, hey, this is sports. Let's keep politics out of it. Let's keep religion out of it. Um, yeah. and that, And it's sort of acceptable now. So it's it's interesting because when I look at your you know I look at your stats it's like that one year I think it was 2010 2011 with Glen Torren you look like a striker by all the stats you know you have there what was it like playing up front did you enjoy playing up front or was it purely just like I'm ready to do whatever I can to show my value for this team Yeah no it was like I still have this conversation I had it with Phil Dos Santos last week and <laughs> you know um like we're short on we're short on center backs at the minute until drew's back fit um you know some boys pick up little injuries here and there and and he's like hey if things come to it you know if if the worst comes to it you're the next guy to go in there and, and help the team and <laughs> and i'm like you know wherever you play me i'll always give you 100 percent of no problems whatsoever um because I, i'm very versatile player anyhow and um but yeah, I only played, it was only the first five games I played as a striker that season. Um, because what happened was I moved up a lot of midfielders. I moved up as a striker. And then one of our strikers became, uh, got fit again. You know, so he was actually on the bench for, I think it was two games whenever he came back. And then two centre midfielders, one done as ACL and one done as MCL like in the same game oh, or back-to-back -back games. So then they moved me back in the centre midfield. Um, and I, I think I, the first five games I'd scored nine. So I think of five in the first game and then one in each other game. So I had nine goals in five games. And then I ended up with 25 over the season. Um, 
So I was feeling hot even from midfield and um, <laughs> any goal scorers out there, you know, when, when you're when you're in the zone, uh, and I'll use Harry Kane for an example once again, when he's on it, you know, he can he, can, he scores every game, every other game, um, and whenever you're not feeling, it's it's very tough because and because strikers play on confidence. If they have confidence, you know, they're they're going to be hot. And you seen it with Moses Dyer last year. Yeah. You know, yeah. towards the end of the season, he went in, um, and he was feeling it. And I said, whenever you're feeling it, keep it going. You know, and and that's how he was. Uh, well, you could see it with Moses last year too, near the end of the year, where he was just feeling confident in positions he wasn't willing to take a chance before he was ready to go. It was, uh, it was cool. yeah, and I can see it. Obviously, I, I've went through it myself, and uh, in preseason we're in training, and he's missing the target. He's not scoring goals within training, and he's getting frustrated. Um, and I take him to the side and say, "Hey, calm down. Preseason is just to get you sharp. Now, once you're sharp, that's when the goals come." Um, so it's about, as, as I'm saying, I'll go back to my Portsmouth days and I realize that that's a one takeaway that you have to be super fit and, and sharp because the second that you're not, you'll be found out. And that's, that goes for every single player. If you're defending a 1v1 situation and you're not, you're not fit or you're not sharp, you're going to get taken by and someone's going to score past you. And again, if you're in an attacking situation, you have to be sharp to get away from that defender. You know, so as I said, the Moses just work on your, your sharpness, your fitness, and then they'll come. Um, and then he, he scored one in preseason there against the Whitecaps. And um, he, the, the game against Pacific, he was feeling under the weather. I think he got a little bit of a cold or something like that. But now I see him this, this past week in training and he's looking very sharp again. Um, and, that, and that's what it says. It's all about picking at the right time. So th that's the way it is, you know. But yeah, I got 25 goals that season. Um, and then I moved on to Linfield and whenever I went to Linfield I found myself playing left midfield because we had so many options in every position with with the best of players in the league Do you have a favourite position? Like, given that you're so versatile obviously you're comfortable playing and helping out anywhere but if you were to be that kind of take it off for a minute and be selfish and think about where you'd love to play do you have a favourite position? Yeah, I guess it would have been the number 10 position um, I've always felt uh, most energized, most um, what's the word? Looking forward to every single game when yeah. you're playing there because because you're in a good position to score goals. Um, I've always been a centre midfielder growing up, um, but if you're playing as a ten, you're playing as a, a midfielder and a striker. You yeah. can do both. Yeah. Um, you know, in the last game of the season, you know, we were three 0 down against uh, Edmonton and. And I, I says to Phil, like, throw me up, you know. And I went up beside Moses and Willie. You know, we were really, really under the cost then. And I managed to set up Moses and get the equaliser. Um, and it brought back memories because it scored a lot of goals in that <laughs> at Clark Stadium. Yeah. Um, yep. But, yeah, like, now, obviously, um, I'm older. I guess i got to play a little bit deeper where I can see the game in front of me and, and if in doubt, you can always use your centre backs and goalkeeper to go back to. Um, so now I've, I've I've had to sort of try and change my game slightly in terms of perfecting my longer range passing. Um, if I'm playing from a little bit deeper, um, so that's that's where I, I'm most likely going to play this year, depending on injuries, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. So and provide an I'm fit as well. But again. Uh, to answer your question, I would probably say number 10 back in the day. I'd loved it. So speaking of Clark Field, I think it's 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 a great transition, actually, because I was curious. I wanted to talk a little bit about your first experience with FC Edmonton. So for those who don't know, you are the leading scorer in the history of that club, I think still to this day. Um, now, the NSA, NASL was a very different beast. It's a very unique league for those who didn't. Uh, or aren't aware of that league, the travel was pretty nuts, especially playing in Edmonton. What was it like getting to Edmonton, and how did that move happen? Like, what what put the NASL on your radar? Um, it was actually, I got married in 2012. I was playing for Linfield, and we got married, me and my wife got married in Gran Canaria, one of the islands just off Spain. Um, it's actually off the coast of Africa. And the day after the wedding, all our guests went home and we stayed for another week as like a honeymoon. 
And the day after the wedding, she just says, hey, can you play football somewhere else? And it was a strange question to me because I'm playing for Linfield, my boyhood club. I would just won the double. I'd won the league and cup. Um, I'm sitting in the sun, all inclusive, just been married the day before. And it was a strange question for your wife. Your new wife has just said, <laughs> can you play football somewhere else? And and she was, I'm like, what do you mean somewhere else? And she basically said, you know, the other side of the world. I'd love to go and move somewhere else and start a family somewhere else. Um, you know, because Belfast is, there's very limited opportunities, you know, um, in Belfast. Um, there's a lot more now, to be fair. Uh, but she was like, America, Australia. Like Canada didn't even come into the equation, um, because there it was it was America or Australia. That's where everyone was going to, and those are the countries that we seen on the TV all the time, you know, with the movies and things like that. Um, and I'm like, sure, I'll look into it. So I actually used to live with Azmir Begovic, the goalkeeper. Um, me and him played at Portsmouth together. We lived together for a couple of years, um, when we both signed professional, and the two of us had the same agent. But I had a different agent at the time, and uh, his agent, who was also my agent a few years before, he was American and he worked for IMG, um, the the sports group. And I says, "Hey, Asmir, can you see if Will can get me a move to America? Because he ha he's obviously from there and he has contacts." Um, so yeah, Asmir actually says, "What about FC Edmonton? You know, they've set up a team that they played last year." Because Asmir grew up in Edmonton, you know, he was born in Bosnia, but he moved to Germany, then he moved to Canada as a refugee and grew up in Edmonton. So he he, he knew a lot of people there. And I was like, yeah, sure. So I, I looked into it. They're in the NASL. I think there were only seven teams at the time in the league. Mm -hmm. And he says, send me over your video. So um, I actually sent in a video. I, I didn't have a video. I had to make the video. So I went on the BBC Sport website, pulled off the, the goals that I scored from the previous season and, and the goals that I scored um, at Glen Torn. There was a, a lot of goals to throw in there, so it was very, very good. And um, I just sent them it to him, sent it to him. And FC Edmonton had Colin Miller at the time, who just came in as a coach, and he's Scottish. So he was like, hey, let's go and scout. This guy it gives me a chance to go back to Scotland and see family as well, you know, all expenses paid. Yeah. But he came and watched the game for me for Linfield, and he liked our centre back as well, which was Albert Watson, became our captain at FC Edmonton, and that's where we came about. He said, "I would love, I would love you over," and I says, "Okay, let's do it." But it was actually the, it was the previous year before, I almost went to Puerto Rico, um, because they were in the same league. Yeah. And Colin Clark is from Northern Ireland, and he was their head coach at the time. And he's friends with another agent that I had, like the year after it, um, a guy called Neil Sillett. And he's good friends with him, and Neil says, how about you go to Puerto Rico? But again, um, we looked into it, and obviously me and my wife wanted to go somewhere to start a family in Puerto Rico. We looked into it, done a bit of research, and we were like, you know, this is a place to go if you're single. It's not a place to go to start a family. Um, and and then that's where we, we ended up in Edmonton. And, uh, you know, we, we love, as soon as we came to Canada, you know, it was minus 30 when we first landed. It, it never felt cold like it before. It was like Jack Frost just punching you as soon as you came out of the airport. Um, and we love the country, you know, and and that, that that's us in Canada. You know, we we went back home to Ireland a few years ago when we had the kid, um, and then we came back here, which was is, we haven't looked back. We love it. So, uh, you know, know, knowing that uh, you know we, we don't want to talk forever about your about uh, at the NASL because it's super interesting, and I could talk about it forever because it's just this very unique league. What was your kind of favorite memory from your time in playing for Edmonton in the NS NASL? Um, the favorite memory, like I did love playing at Clark Field in the stadium or in the summertime. That was really good. You know, we, we used to get 4,000, 5,000 fans at the games. Um, for whatever reason, they don't get that anymore. Mm -hmm. But, you know, 
I had a lot of friends there and my wife would come out and watch the games, playing the game, hopefully get a win. And then you were able to go for food after it. And, you know, it was very content, but really, really enjoyed it. And then obviously we got to travel to some, some beautiful cities in America. You know, we got to go to Miami, New York, you know, San Antonio, places like that. Uh, there was four teams in Florida. So we were always down in Tampa, Fort Lauderdale, um, Jacksonville. We got to go to visit these, these really cool cities in, in America. So that was one of the highlights as well. And especially if you went down and you had a couple of days off, you know, we were down in Jacksonville. We had, we had a day off one time and um, we went down and we went and watched the last round of the Arnold Palmer Invitational Golf yeah. Tournament. Yeah. And it just so happened that one of our players went to school with Nick Taylor, the Canadian golfer, <laughs> who he was able to call and leave his tickets. Amazing. And we got to go in and meet a lot of the players and things because we, I obviously wanted to go and watch Roy McIlroy. Yeah. Um, you know, so that, that was playing in the NASL. That was the, the fun part. Um, you know, and uh, yeah, that was really, really good. <laughs> I won't ask about the travel because it's pretty self explanatory in terms yeah, of getting the travel a direct flight tough. back to Edmonton. <laughs> I remember we, we had the flight to Puerto Rico, it was three flights. We left at 5 in the morning, got there at 1 a.m., Puerto Rico. We play Puerto Rico the next day. Then uh, the day after, we flew to San Francisco. Oh we played them on the Wednesday. Then after that, we had to fly back to North Carolina and play them. And then we had to fly back to Edmonton. You know, it was like, who designed this schedule? And, you know, <laughs> the money that was costing to fly around, you know, it could have been... Could have been managed a little bit better. I guess that's why the league didn't survive. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's that was uh that was tough travel times, but you sort of get used to it, and you find a way you find a way to sleep on on the plane. Um, and then whenever Netflix were allowed you to download programs, it made it a little bit easier as well. Yeah. That would have made it easier for sure. Yeah. So, um, you know, from from. FC Edmonton, there was a quick pit stop in, in Cincinnati uh, in the USL, and then you went back to Edmonton, um, and then the NASL kind of hit its end. Um, and it seemed like at that point, you actually jumped back over and you went to, I'm hoping I say this correctly, uh, Sligo Rovers? Sligo? I'm sorry Sligo Rovers. It. Sligo. See, I knew I was going to say it wrong. I, ha yes. I had to preface it. How did that happen? Was that where you wanted to go? Was the wife wanting to go back over? What was what was the, what was the history there? Um, so in 2018, I actually never played at all in 2018. Um, I just got to get a charger here quick. Yeah, yeah no it's worries. Good. The kid is sleeping on the sofa. <laughs> um, so yeah, in 2018, obviously the the uh, I'll just put the charger in. Yeah, no worries. Um, yeah, so 2018, the, the, my wife fell pregnant um, and the NASL folded and the CPL wasn't going to be set up until 2019. Mm -hmm. So we were in, I went back in May to Belfast and to start my coaching badges, I start my UFA license. So the plan was go back to start my coaching badges in Belfast. The wife would stay in Edmonton. Ross County in Scotland actually wanted me over to make sure I was fit because they, they wanted to sign me. Um, so the plan was to do two weeks in Belfast on my coaching, fly over to Scotland, and do some fitness and medicals with Ross County, and then sign there, fly back to Edmonton, get my pregnant wife, and our two dogs that we have and fly back to Glasgow and have the kid or to Scotland and have the kid in Scotland. Um, but my wife, um, while I was in, in Belfast, she had to go and see the doctor while she was pregnant. And the doctor says, hey, you've got some blood condition within the legs. You can't, I don't advise you to fly across the Atlantic. You know, there's a possibility you could have a blood clot. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, okay. Um, I booked my flight that night, went back to Edmonton, and we had to stay in Edmonton until the kid was born. And the kid wasn't born until August, and this was May. So that's hence the reason I didn't play all 2018. 
Um, and then as soon as the kid was born, you know, I says, let's go back to Ireland, see family. You know, it was our first kid. Um, and we went back to Ireland so the family could meet the kid and we could spend time. We hadn't seen them in a few years. And while we were back there, you know, the, the, the CPL were trying to get together, get things up and running. And obviously I would have been tied to Edmonton because um, the way they were setting it up, it was sort of, you know, the Valor would have had first choice and the guys from Winnipeg and, and vice versa around the league. Um, but while I was there, it was, it was actually January time and my agent called me and says, hey, would you be interested in Sligo Rovers? And Sligo was maybe three and a half, three hour, three and a half hour drive from Belfast. So I actually drove down, played a game, and the manager wanted to sign me right away. So I spoke with my wife, and and she was like, yeah, why not? You know, we'll stay here for another year. It means we get to see family. Um, and then we can move back to Canada the following year. And, and that was the plan. So we had a really good time in Sligo. You know, my wife was off maternity. Um, she had all the time in the world to herself, and I was able just to concentrate on, on my football. So I played for Sligo for for a year, um, and and really, whenever I played there, it really made me fall back in love, the the real passion uh, back into football, mm -hmm. because obviously not playing in twenty eighteen and other things were more important. The the family life far more important still is now, but mm -hmm. it really made me fall back in love with the game and and really put my full commitment and put the hours in. Um, and then I came back to Rob Gale and gave me a call and, and Sligo wanted to re-sign me. Um, I had a couple of teams in Belfast uh, speaking to me and I think this was, it was a week before Christmas. Now, it was actually a, around Christmas. It was maybe Christmas Eve, Rob, for me. And the transfer window was opening back up in January again in Northern Ireland. And Sligo wanted to know before because... They, they didn't want to get into any, uh, I guess, any uh, wage demands type thing where one club offers you this. And so yeah. they wanted to know before January. January, And I says, look, Rob, if you can get it done this week, let's get it done this week. And I'm all yours because we do want to go back to Canada. And Rob was like, hey, Damien's going to call you. Damien, Damien Rock gave me a call. And mm -hmm. um, we got it sorted, you know, and... Uh, Thankfully, we came back, but then all, all of a sudden, COVID hit. <laughs> we were we were in Winnipeg, uh, locked down in the first month um, with a one-year-old. And we're like, okay, what do we do now? <laughs> <laughs> um, and then that, that was an experience in itself for everyone, mm -hmm. you know, not just me. Yeah. But uh, that's how we ended up back in, back in Canada in, in Winnipeg, and we've settled very well. I was going to ask you, know, what was your first experience in Winnipeg? But it wouldn't have been a lot of if you dropped back down in here in the beginning of COVID. Yeah, we um, two training, two training sessions, um, and then Michelle, who worked for us at the time, came in and says, "Hey, we think stuff's locking down with COVID." And um, one of my friends lives in Toronto, and he actually works for a pharmaceutical company. Mm -hmm. um, and I called him, and he just says, he basically said, "Hey, I was on a." I was on a FaceTime with Justin Trudeau <laughs> a few days ago. Um, everything's going, the whole country's going to get locked down. And I'm like, okay. So then I, obviously, I guess the club would have been in more meetings, but I, I spoke to our club and says, hey, this has came from a good source. The, the country's going to get locked down. And, and it did. No one would have imagined it. And it did. One of the things that's really interesting too is I when I think about that year, it's actually pretty incredible that there was a season and I know it wasn't the best experience for players, but it was a fantastic distraction uh, for some of us through that time when we're locked down. Right. And, and thinking of that, some of these clubs were owned by the Canadian football league and they didn't even have a season, but the fact that the Canadian premier league went off and had one was actually pretty impressive. Um, what did you think of that first year playing for Valor? Obviously it wasn't in Winnipeg the whole time. It wasn't exactly the experience you'd expected, but what was your first, uh, I don't know, first season with Valor, like? It was, individually and personally, it was very tough. Um, I got injured. We went, Obviously, we went to PEI. 
um, and it was only like a seven games, so it was only a six week thing. And I get injured two weeks before we were traveling, so I was fighting fit to try and get myself fit for the game. And you know, I wasn't fully fit and played against Calgary, and we went in 2 0 down at half time. And I'm like, Rob, you know, you may take me off, I'm not, I'm not up to, up to standard at the minute. Um, you need to get other boys on the pitch and see if they can do a job. Um, you know, so it was anyone that anyone who got injured, either just before it or during it, you know, that was their tournament done really. Yeah. Um, you know, we had guys that we hurt their hamstring in the first game and that, that was the whole tournament done. Even all the other teams as well. You know, so it was very, very difficult for anyone who got a, an injury um, or a little knock. Um, but thankfully I got back fit for, I guess, the last game against Forge. We drew 2-2 with him. Um, you know, so it was good to get back then. And, and then, obviously, last year, we we got a lot better in terms of having mm-hmm. posting the bubble in Winnipeg. You know, the city, the club done fantastic to get it up and running and then actually get out and have a full season. And then last year was even tough, even more tough, because we're playing two games a week. Yeah. And someone, a 34-year-old like myself, it was, <laughs> I'm like, hey, I need more days to recover. Um, but it was crazy because the the body just, the human body just adapts to anything. And then all of a sudden you're just, you're playing two games a week and your body hurts and you're, you're not playing on the best of fields. Yeah. And the body, the body just adapts and you just get on with it, you know, and, and sort of, I'm like, hey, okay got to sacrifice yourself here for the best of the team and and we didn't we we tried to make the playoffs we missed out by a point we were in a good position last year um for whatever reason things didn't go too well um and then we sort of picked it up towards the end of the season but again we knew if we beat edmonton in the last game we would have made it because york had a very tough game against Mm -hmm. forge um and we let ourselves down, you know, we went 2-0 down early doors, come out at half time, 3-0 down. Um, and, and that was really disappointing because I knew that I played for Edmonton for five years or whatever it was. And I knew it's a very tough place to go to. And that's our first game next week. And even though they're, they've got financial problems or whatever's going on at the club and mm-hmm. they can't get to pick the best of the squad that they want, it's a very, very tough place to go to regardless. Um, because we would we would have beat New York Cosmos and the Miamis there and and you know New York Cosmos had World Cup winners in their team yep, things yep. like that and we would beat them in Edmonton um, for whatever reason it's just a very tough place it's like going to Stoke on a Tuesday night as they say <laughs> uh, but yeah last year um, we 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 just missed out and our plan is to make it better this year. Well, I feel like there's there's truly momentum season to season. I know it's been tough the, the first couple of years, but we see that growth. We see that that the you know the the, the way that you guys play together, um, you just see more of and more of a unit each game that went by. So it was something of of uh, you know I'm I'm excited not only to be able to be back at IG Field again, but uh, also to be able to watch you guys grow. I think that uh, you guys might shock. Well, I'm biased, obviously, but I'm, yeah. <laughs> I know you guys are going to shock people. Um, I'll, I'll come up with a couple more questions because we're almost at an hour. and I don't want to take too much more of your time, Daryl. So um, what I'll ask you here is, you know, the growth of Canadian soccer, you know, from someone who grew up in Northern Ireland, you're seeing now, you know, the Canadian men's team is in the World Cup. That's obviously the biggest story right now. You saw the Canadian women win gold in, in, in the Olympics. You know, there is, is such an energy around the sport in this country right now, especially with the announcement of League One, you know, this, this possible second tier that they're, they're going to build nationally. As somebody who, you know, didn't grow up in Canada, you know, you sort of, uh, you, you wanted to experience it. What do you see uh, in the future here for Canada? Do you see a lot of good things coming? Oh, for sure. You know, I whenever I first came in 2013, I seen it. Um, I remember when I first went to Edmonton and they says, hey, there's a couple of good kids here. 16, 17 year olds and they, they were training with us the first team they were part of the first team squad and there was five of them and five of them were just as good or if not better than the kids that I see in Europe you know and and but the 
the huge difference was they hadn't they hadn't experienced or had someone who understood what it took to guide them um and that's very unfortunate because even when we were there like, even though they were 16 or 17 if if they stepped out of line slightly or they had a poor attitude like i would give them a mouthful and let them know hey you can't do that and mm. you need to you need to give 100 percent every single day you come to work and but they the five players just didn't have it in them and they were quality players uh and none of the five are playing right now and i i could actually see it and i remember saying to one of the coaches you know you need to really you need re, really need to get discipline into these players it's for their own benefit because instead of them like just half-assing it you have to get it into their, their brain and their minds that hey i gotta get up early and i gotta go to work and i gotta put the work in there's no days off but they just didn't have that that grit inside them which let them down in the end but i could see the quality there um and i'm I, i'm looking around obviously i was just new to the country researching a lot of the country and i'm like okay i always say the best thing for the young kids to do is is to get to europe as quick as possible because whenever you're in europe obviously it's the best place for soccer in the world when you're there you're taught the right way not just the right way to play and to better yourself as a player the right way to conduct yourself as a person um to how to be a professional how to live like a professional it's not you're you're a soccer player when you turn up for training it's your soccer player every minute of the day like how you sleep how you eat and how you speak to people it's just how you process um information coming to you which can benefit you on the field and off the field it's all those things that go into it and obviously you can see now that with the national team you've got jonathan david alfonso davies are playing for top teams mm -hmm. you know scotty arfield um when he was playing eustachio like you can even see big atiba dropping in the center back and still one of the best players in the pitch yeah you know so these are guys that understand what it takes understands that there's different levels to the game because now when they go to the world cup and they, they got to play belgium and croatia in the first two games you know there, there's a semi-final and finalists <laughs> in the last world cup yeah. and one of them could have won it easily you know <laughs> you, you're really up against it and it's another another test but that's the whole point it's to go there and see how you can compete against the belgians and the croatias and learn from these guys bring it back to canada and continue to pro progress and that's the thing as long as there's continue continue to grow have a growth mindset you, you'll get there eventually and you'll and you'll be now canada's competing against the best in the world and who's to say that they can't throw up and it's uh, throw up and upset you know all of a sudden you play the first game and and there's a red card for the other team and you manage to come away with a one nil win macedonia beat italy not long yeah. ago last week you know <laughs> anything can happen this game and when you have players like alfonso davies jonathan david you know um Larea, you know these guys can i seen some of the games you're defending and then all of a sudden the midfielder picks up the ball i think it might have been liam miller he sings a ball through for for jonathan david and he, he brings it down beautifully and scores when you have that quality if you defend well you have every every possibility to win that game and obviously you're coming up against the best in the world in belgium and croatia now but when you have that quality um especially on a counter-attack if you fonzie back on the counter-attack <laughs> you know with the pace and the power then all of a sudden you have you have a chance you know so i'm very excited to watch canada at the world cup and um and that's the thing there's a lot of growth and but now the the, the penny's finally dropping that this is a soccer country there's mm -hmm. so much quality here um obviously the women have been excellent over the last lot of years and now it's the men have, have finally got up to it you know and and should be in the, this world cup and the next world cup as well which will be exciting um but that's the thing you need to continue to progress and grow the game and now what we have is we have kids that they want to play soccer instead of hockey now yeah 
and that that's that's the key as well because who's to know over over a lot of years there might have been some top quality soccer players for example imagine Alfonso Davies decided to play hockey when he was 14 instead of soccer you know and and, that, and that's what happened it could be a possibility and now there's there's kids that want to play soccer instead yeah. because they have they have their favorite players they have idols on the national stage now and it's it's incredible to see and for me I'm very fortunate because you know my son's three and it's a good time for him growing up as a young kid in a few years when he's really hopefully he's really into it if not then it's whatever whatever makes him happy yeah. but now he's going to grow up and he's going to see the soccer on tv non-stop now um there's going to be so much hype about it and and it's excellent you know so and it's a good thing so i'm thinking who's to say in 20 years time you have 11 players with the quality of alfonso davies on the pitch with Don, jonathan david if you've got 11 players 11 players like that even the subs because you look at the top nations in the world the frances the belgiums the germany's you know they bring on a sub and you're like whoa this guy's just as good as the last guy that went off. <laughs> yeah. you know and and that's where you want to aim to um because pe- a lot of people think america should have done it at some point with the resources that they have you know and they don't they done well in one world cup and they haven't really progressed since now canada for me i think canada have more of the um so to speak the humility about themselves um i'm speaking as a an outsider from canada at the minute i'm speaking more as a northern irish guy yeah. and i guess the canadians are, are a lot more humble and have a lot more humility um in everything i would guess um and that's not to be disrespectful to the americans because i have a lot of american friends and i tell them the same thing <laughs> you know just have a little bit more humility and and you know it's not just about america you have to respect everyone else as well yeah. um and i think i i really do believe in 20 years time canada could have a squad of 18 players that are that are up there with with the frances with the germany's you know in, in northern ireland we've been trying to do it for a lot of years we're always under it because we don't have a bigger population um and we also have a lot of players that will go down and play for Republic of Ireland. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, so it, we've been up against it. But again, England have finally got there. I guess they have been working on it the last 10 years with the, the coach education, which is huge. Um, and that's a thing that I know the Irish Football Association has been working with the Canadian Soccer Association in terms of coach education. And it's a huge, huge part of the growth in the, in the country. Um, because, you know, obviously the Canadian coach education wouldn't have been up the standard with what there is in Europe and Northern Ireland was, we were way behind as well. And then all of a sudden they changed, they grew the coach education department. Um, and the, the, the top coaches started coaching the coaches to be better coaches so that mm-hmm. they can filter down. And now you can see that within the Canadian and now we have a Canadian Premier League here. You know, it's 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 excellent. It's it's a good start for for the whole country. Um, it's tremendous to see, and and for my son to grow up as a Canadian as well. It's obviously when if if he's good enough, he'll have to decide whether he wants to play for Canada or Northern Ireland. And <laughs> I'll leave it to him. He can he can decide. Um, but obviously, he has to he has to become good enough, and that's if he even likes soccer. He might like something else instead. No, I'm in the same with my son. I'm like, if he chooses, you know, I'm there with you the whole way. But maybe you don't want to do that. Who knows? Yeah, you can you can sort of <laughs> push him in that direction. Yeah. Uh, like, don't you like I... this? This thing that I put in front of you over and over again? Yeah. <laughs> well, you know what? I've really appreciated this interview. I, I didn't expect it to take this long, but this has actually been a fantastic conversation, Daryl. I really do appreciate your time today. One last question, and it's very Winnipeg focused. But if you had a friend come to Winnipeg, what would be the one thing that you would recommend for them to do when they were here? Um, it would be te- it would um, depend on what season we're in. Well, let's go with summer because we don't usually want our friends to come over in the winter. <laughs> yeah. All right. So if it's the summertime, I would say, hey, go down, check out the forks, um, go down, get some good food down there, and and spend a time bit a uh, bit of time down there, and then 
get in the car and we'll go to Grand Beach for the day. You know, people don't realize that there, there's beautiful beaches just north of Winnipeg. And <laughs> I, I'm telling the guy, the new guys that have came here and I'm showing them pictures. This is this is like a couple of hours away from Winnipeg. And mm. there's a, you can go east if you want. You, you can go on these beautiful hikes, you know. So I, I, I would say, okay, we'll, we'll go to the Forks, get some nice food and um, taste some different food from good fish and chips down there as well yes. that, that they wouldn't they would love to have and then go up and spend the day in, uh, in grand beach i would i would say so there's one question from the chat and it relates to this so i'll share it with you but if you had a favorite spot to eat someone darth butcher is curious of where you would go what's your favorite spot to eat in winnipeg um i don't have a big horizon because because of covid i wasn't able to go out as much <laughs> that's fair that's fair um, and then when we do go out, we've usually got the kid with us. So we need to go somewhere that that allows a screaming kid. And yeah. the, a screaming kid is acceptable in the restaurant. <laughs> um, but I'm trying to think, the, where do we go? Um, we went to a nice sushi place. I'm actually, I'm, I don't know the, the name of it. You know, it was actually quite nice. But then I was in BC last week getting top quality sushi so yeah, that's it's different. sort of downgraded the restaurant here we talked about levels in football well there's levels in sushi depending on how yeah. far away you <laughs> yeah, are so from the coast <laughs> it's downgraded me slightly downgraded it slightly <laughs> here um but uh, that's the one thing i have to really get out and start start exploring a lot more um which we haven't really got the chance to and we were talking about it yesterday we need to go on a lot more date nights and get a babysitter in <laughs> um but yes uh I would probably just say go to the Forks because you can get the yeah. you can get the taste. I love going down there, and you've got different selections. Um, Grab a cinnamon bun at any time of the day, fish and chips, whatever it is, right? Yeah, you know, I'm I'm not the type of guy that will be like, hey, go to Joey's or go to yours because it's just a chain restaurant yeah, yeah. around the place, and you know, I like to. Um, there's actually a nice little place that does nice pizza down on uh, Portage um i actually don't know the name of it they do pizzas on tuesdays and wednesdays i think uh well, i forget the name if you ever remember just fire it over my way i'd be curious yeah to try it out. they do some nice pizza and coffee in there it's on nice. 40s avenue um i forget the name I, I know exactly where it is though uh but yeah i need to get out a lot more and, and ex <laughs> explore a lot more but it's getting the time to do it you know picking the kid up from daycare and then getting him bath and, and fed and getting ready for the next day again. Yeah. Especially if I'm tired from training, depending on what session the coach has put on. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, no, no worries. Right. It's a lot at once, but you know what? That's, it, that's, it's kind of the thing though in Winnipeg is that you just sort of find a spot you love. I don't remember most of the places names that I go to, but I can tell you where it is. <laughs> yeah. That's the thing. It's like, go down this road, go here. And, and this is where it is. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But, well, uh, thank you very much, Daryl. I really appreciate your time today. Thank you for sticking around for, you know, the, 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 the interview today and uh, have a great rest of your Sunday. Yeah. Thanks so much, Jeremy. It's been a pleasure and uh, a good time of the day you got because the kid fell asleep. The, <laughs> the, the wife works from home. So, so she was on a break for half an hour and she was able to put him his afternoon nap. So Perfect. there was no screaming kid. <laughs> Perfect. It worked out. Well, good luck into the season. We'll see you at IG field when you guys are there and good luck next week when you start. Thank you so much. And we'll see you at IG when we're right there. Absolutely. Thanks very Thank much you. for being here. Thanks. So that was Daryl Fordyce of Valor FC, the Canadian Premier League team. And this has been Scoot Talk Sports Episode 10. We are back. There'll be some more episodes coming soon. Stay tuned. So with that, guys, we're going to go ahead and raid over to someone who is live in the sports program on Twitch here, um, just to end this out. So a big thank you to everybody who was hanging out in chat. Uh, a massive thank you to Valor FC, as well as Daryl for making time to hang out today and have a chat. Um, what I'm thinking is we'll probably, I don't know, who do we want to raid over to, guys? Let's take a peek. If you have any suggestions, let me know. Otherwise, I'm probably just going to drop in on a friend of mine. And we'll just drop you guys over there. If you feel uh, like helping out, drop a like, uh, drop a follow on uh, this person we're raining. Otherwise, I will see you guys the next time we are live. 
Um, as always, you can find this episode. It'll be edited and shared out on, oops, shared and edited out on um, podcast networks. Of course, I'm going to edit this out so this end is not so rough. But uh, absolutely, Akio would be someone I'd love to love to interview. Um, let me go to the dashboard here, and I'll quickly select a raid. So what I'm thinking is we'll go over and raid my man Limo. He is a football manager, creator, as well as a mental health advocate. Uh, he is uh, always around for a good conversation. Let's go over and raid Limo. Say a little hello. Big thank you, everybody. Once again, if you want to find the podcast at any time, just search Scoot to Talk Sports on your favorite podcast app. Until the next episode, thank you for being here. Take care.